Steve Tedamonti. And uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Guy Sterling here tonight. He's going to give us a lecture on the seated Lincoln statue and its dedication. So, so without further ado, Guy, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, before we start, just a couple things, if I could. Um, I have given several lectures in the past, uh, primarily for the Newark History Society, and my able assistant in those endeavors has graciously agreed to participate tonight. I'd like a round of, appla a round of applause, please, for Amanda Dios. <laughs> Amanda, if I may do a little boasting on her behalf, just finished her first year as a PhD student at Rutgers Newark. Good. Right, okay. Perfect 4-0 average. Ooh. So you're going to be hearing a lot more from this lady. Just give her a little time so she gets that degree, then there's no stopping her. Um, let me just talk a little bit about this. Uh, a week ago, I gave a lecture to, substantially the same lecture, but this one's going to be a little bit longer and more in-depth, to the school children of Newark over at the county courthouse. And I thought that was very important to do because it's the children, the young adults, who will keep the, you know, our history alive and carry it into the next generations. Uh, the genesis of this project was this. About a year ago, we dedicated the statue of Justice Brennan in front of the Hall of Records, and uh, I was part of that effort, and at the end, as I was uh, leaving the county executive's office that day, they were, people were shaking hands and thanking each other and kind of congratulating themselves for a good job. And they looked at me and I said, well, let's not, you know, let, let's not jump ahead of ourselves here because there is one more project that we have to think about on these grounds. And they were like, well, what's that? And because the Brennan project was very long and involved and um, took a lot of time, had to raise a lot of money, reached out to a lot of people, did it in 10 months, which is pretty quick for a project of that magnitude. And I said, well, you know, next year is the 100th anniversary of the seated Lincoln statue. And of course, they looked at me and their eyes rolled in their head and they go, oh no, here he goes again with another one of his projects. But I wasn't going to let it pass, and so I continued to press the county officials saying that something has to be done. And so we started earlier this year to talk about what would happen, and uh, it moved along slowly. But we, you know, eventually everything kind of came together. And um, the county authorities, uh, in their wisdom, felt that having a ceremony at the site on the actual uh, anniversary, 100th anniversary of the dedication wasn't really going to work because it was on May 30th, 1911, and of course, May, th which was Memorial Day in the days we used to celebrate Memorial Day or commemorate Memorial Day on May 30th, and it actually turned out that this year, May 30th, was also Memorial Day. And I just didn't feel that in this day and age that they draw much of a crowd, so the county executive decided to have the event on June 8th instead, and that's what we used as our, our target date. But um, and that's fine. It was fine. And um, so we've had uh, that lecture before the, for the school children, the lecture tonight, the um, ceremony tomorrow at the statue. And, um, but still, I felt that something needed to be done on the actual anniversary date itself. And on May 30th, Memorial Day, a week ago yesterday, um, a group of about 15 or 16 of us showed up at the statue and um, we read this, we laid a wreath and we, we read the speeches that were given at the site a hundred years ago. And I'll make generous mention of some of those speeches in here. But that to me was uh, very important because I didn't think we could um, let the day go by without 
marking it in some way. So here we are tonight for the second and final lecture on the seated Lincoln statue in Newark. And um, let's get into it. Good evening and welcome. My name is Guy Sterling. I will be leading this evening's program on the seated Lincoln statue. For a century, one of the most celebrated pieces of public art in all of the United States. As you know by now, the statue was dedicated 100 years ago, a week ago yesterday, in a ceremony that was a watershed event in Newark's almost 350 year history, primarily because it featured a speech by former President Theodore Roosevelt, the only living ex-president at the time. The statue has survived the ravages of time, weather and pollution, as well as the wayward hand of the vandal, and continues resting in its place today as a shining bronzed symbol of justice, fairness, and equality. In an editorial, the Newark News once said that what the Eiffel Tower is to Paris and the Houses of Parliament are to London, the Lincoln statue is to Newark. Surely so, but the seated Lincoln is not just a Newark treasure or a New Jersey treasure, it is an American treasure. So much so that in 1995, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Our program tonight will be divided into three segments. First, the people responsible for the statue and making its dedication such an historic event. Second, the dedication ceremony itself. And finally, the statue's legacy. Any discussion of the seated Lincoln statue has to begin with the man who paid to have the statue sculpted, cast, and installed, Amos Van Horn, one of Newark's greatest citizens, and sadly, a man whose legacy here has been all but forgotten. Van Horn was born in Warren County in 1840, one of nine children. His father was the proprietor of a general store. The Van, Van Horn family moved to Newark in 1855, but returned to Warren County during the nation's financial panic the following year. But Amos came back and in 1860, borrowed $5 from one of his brothers to open a small furniture repair shop on Market Street. At the start of the Civil War in 1861, with the furniture repair business slowing, Van Horn opted to open a secondhand furniture store instead, and it prospered. It also was on Market Street. But as the war between the states progressed, Van Horn answered the call to duty and volunteered for service in the Union Army, selling his business for $25. He served in combat and was cited for gallantry. He was mustered out of the military in June 1863 and returned to Newark to start up a business again on Market Street, this time on a grand total of $200. Almost from the start, it was a success. And over the years, Amos Van Horn built his furniture retail and home furnishings operation at 73 Market Street into one of Newark's largest and most profitable businesses. As his business grew, Van Horn put up additional building space in the area of Market Street between Washington Street in what is now University Avenue. The block is still something of a home for the furniture trade. Around the turn of the 20th century, Van Horn sold stock in his company. In July 1906, control of the business passed out of his hands to a successor firm called Copperweight and Van Horn. Nonetheless, Amos remained active in the business as a director and vice president. In 1907, after 35 years of marriage, Van Horn's wife, 
the former Emma Clark Wilcox died, leaving him alone since the couple had no children. At that point, Van Horn began giving away large sums of his fortune to charitable causes, usually anonymously. The recipients of his generosity often included some of his old Civil War comrades. Van Horn died the day after Christmas in 1908, and in his will, he left money for three statues in Newark, including $25,000 for the Lincoln statue. He said he wanted the statue placed either in Lincoln Park or in front of the courthouse and left it to his executors to decide the best spot. Van Horn also said he wanted the statue named the Lincoln Post Monument in honor of one of the seven Grand Army of the Republic posts in Newark to which he belonged as a charter member, post number 11. These were groups of Civil War veterans who gathered socially, but also became a potent political force in this country lasting into the 20th century. They've been replaced today by the sons of the Union veterans of the Civil War, an organization that doesn't carry anywhere near the same amount of clout as its predecessor. The seated Lincoln statue in Newark, along with other statues around the country, came on the heels of the Chicago World's Columbian Ex Exposition in 1893 that had showcased the work of many great public sculptors. It was that exposition that inspired Newark and other large cities in the United States in the late 19th century to begin embellishing their public spaces. The job of creating, of crafting the Lincoln piece in Newark fell to Gutzon Borglum, who'd already sculpted the six-ton marble bust of Lincoln that sits in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Borglum was born in Idaho in March 1867 to Danish immigrants. Before moving into sculpting, he was an accomplished painter, specializing in scenes of the Old West. Borglum badly wanted the Lincoln job in Newark, but was not keen about competing for it as a three-member monument committee had initially envisioned. One of the committee members was the preeminent librarian and founder of the Newark Museum, John Cotton Dana. The Rutgers Newark Library is named in his honor. Ultimately, Borglum was able to get the commission by submitting a model for the statue that was approved almost immediately. Borglum's friendship with Ralph Lum, a prominent Newark attorney and chief executor of the Van Horn estate, was key in Borglum getting the commission for the Lincoln statue. Borglum was given the commission in 1909, right after he had been awarded an honorary master's degree from Princeton, bestowed upon him by then president, by its then president and future president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. A series of gargoyles that Borglum sculpted in the early 20th, 20th century can be seen on the class of 1879 dormitory at Princeton. It can be safely said that Borglum's affinity for Lincoln bordered on the obsessive. As a point in fact, he named his only son after the former president. For two years, Borglum immersed himself in the Lincoln Project, studying everything about the former president he could get his hands on and talking to anyone who could give him a perspective on Lincoln that he wasn't aware of or had overlooked. Borglum also took exacting measurements of one of Lincoln's life masks, learning it by heart. Lincoln had two life masks made, one completed in April 1860 and the other in February 1865, just before his assassination. From the mask, Lincoln concluded, or Bor I'm sorry, from the mask, Borglum concluded that the right side of Lincoln's face was more expressive than the left, something that comes through clearly in the statue. Here's how he put it. 
His right side was determined, developed, ancient. The left side was immature, plain, and physically not impressive. Borglum began the sculpting process by making several small clay models and enlarged the image along the way. At his side, at all time, was a vast collection of Lincoln photographs that he referred to in helping him shape his image. He completed the clay model for the statue at his studio on 38th Street in Manhattan. It was one of the last works he finished there before moving his sculpting operation to the countryside outside of Stamford, Connecticut, a place he called Borgland. The Lincoln sculpture, one and one half times, uh, one and one half life size, was cast by the Gore Manuf Manufacturing Company of Providence, Rhode Island as one piece, as opposed to having it cast in multiple pieces and welded together. Having it cast as a single piece was said to add 40% to the statue's cost, an expense that Borglum himself incurred because he felt it would add to his work's stature and beauty if it didn't have seam marks. Borglum also paid for some of the site work at the statue's location. This is a picture of the um, groundbreaking ceremony. Borglum's um, standing in the middle with the, uh, the hat cocked over the right side of his face. Preparation of the site included removal of a tree or two that needed to be approved by the city's shade tree commission, one of the most powerful quasi-public authorities in Newark at the time and for years afterwards. In fact, the Shade Tree Commission played such a key role in the project from its inception that its members were acknowledged by name in the statue's dedication program. Borglum's casting of Lincoln in a seated position on a bench did not occur by happenstance. In studying Lincoln's life, Borglum took note of the president's practice of slipping away to the White House garden when he felt particularly overwhelmed by dis dispatches he was receiving from the front lines of the Civil War. To Borglum, these visits were to Lincoln's Garden of Gethsemane. To a certain extent in conceptualizing his piece, Borglum also used the famous statue of the thinker by Auguste Rodin, a sculptor he knew from time he spent learning his craft in Europe earlier in his career. This is what Lincoln had to say about what he was trying to capture in his seated Lincoln piece. The Lincoln I have endeavored to portray is not thinking about himself or about anything that will be of advantage to himself. His mind is engrossed with the vast responsibilities that have weighed him down. The third major player in the history of the Lincoln statue is, of course, Theodore, I'm not keen about being called Teddy, Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States who took office at age 42 upon the assassination of William McKinley and was elected Commander-in-Chief in 1904. Roosevelt was a historian, a noted conservationist, governor of New York, a war hero, a Medal of Honor winner, and the first American ever to win a Nobel Prize, his for peace. Among other things, he's known today for his foreign policy slogan of speaking softly and carrying a big stick, as well as his expansion of the national park system. Roosevelt was an enormously popular president and is consistently rated one of the nation's best by presidential scholars. His appearance in Newark was not just a big deal, it was major news. The statue was dedicated on Memorial Day 1911 in the days when Memorial Day was always May 30th instead of the last Monday in May that now gives people a three-day weekend. President Roosevelt and Borglum, along with Borglum's wife, came over to New Jersey from New York by ferry and then by open car to Newark. The newspapers estimated that 100,000 spectators lined the roads to Newark just to get a glimpse of the former president. In Newark, they found a 
crowd of between 25 and 40,000 waiting for them at the statue. In addition to the unveiling of the statue, the ceremony included speeches by Roosevelt, Ralph Lum, the executor of the estate, Newark Mayor Jacob Housling, and Maylon Pitney, New Jersey's chancellor at the time. There were also band renditions of the Star Spangled Banner, Marching Through Georgia and America, as well as a reading of Walt Whitman's famous poem, Lamenting Lincoln's Death, O Captain, My Captain. Ralph Lum served as master of ceremonies. The order of business was fairly simple and took place after the unveiling. Because organizers feared the day would be hot, and it was, and because they also feared that so many people showing up might lead to a pressing of flesh and resulting injury, the program was designed to move quickly. And as might be expected, dignitaries and VIPs got tickets to the event so they could be up close, which was important because the newspapers the next day reported that the, spectator, that the speakers could be heard no more than 100 feet from the speaker platform. On behalf of the trustees of the estate, Malon Pitney turned over the statue to Amos Van Horn's veterans group, the Grand Army of the Republic Post Number 11. In the introducing Pitney, Lum said the following. It was a cause of, cream, of keen regret to Mr. Van Horn that those of this city who gave so freely of life and property for the pre preservation of our nation were in no fitting way commemorated. May this memorial of him, who is perhaps most dear to the heart of our nation, be forever a reminder to posterity of the lasting debt owed to Lincoln and to all who helped in his life's work. And this, in part, is what Pitney had to say in his remarks. This is Pitney that day. The statue speaks and will speak to many men with many voices. One may not confidently interpret its meaning for another. But to me, it seems that the artist has pictured the great president alone with his thoughts, not far removed from the hurry and hustle of his environment, but for the moment undisturbed. During a stroll along some secluded path for the rest of the mind and exercise of the body, Mr. Lincoln has paused here and seated himself in an unstudied, negligent pose. Even in the moment of his abstraction, some of the manifold duties of office obtrude themselves. The sense of care, of responsibility, of burden comes back. The problem of the hour insistently claims attention. The lines upon the face deepen. The pensive look comes into the cavernous eyes. The rapt spirit, oblivious of the wearied frame, searches for the proper solution. As yet, no satisfactory answer has been found. But the face manifests a serene confidence in the ultimate triumph of the cause to which this life is dedicated. Founded upon the righteousness of that cause, the good sense, the patience, and patriotism of his people, the courage and devotion of his soldiers and sailors, and the guidance of divine providence. Immediately afterwards, Pitney spoke. Immediately after Pitney spoke, post number 11 turned the title to the statue over to the city, with President Roosevelt and Mayor Housling accepting. The ex-president spoke first, and his was the longest of the day's four speeches, lasting from 15 to 20 minutes and delivered, from what I can tell, without benefit of any notes. His words were quoted verbatim in the newspaper the next day, and they've been reprinted in any number of places since then. Much of the early part of the speech was directed to the contingent of Civil War veterans who had gathered for the occasion. You warred for the union of the American people, Roosevelt told these veterans. You warred for the abolition of slavery throughout the world, for if it failed everywhere else, if it failed here. You warred also for the success of genuine popular government throughout the continents and the hemispheres. But he also spoke to a larger audience in saying that Lincoln had rallied Americans by appealing to their sense of duty rather than to their rights. 
And it was this sense of duty that Roosevelt insisted should continue to inspire Americans to support just causes, just as it had the veterans of the Civil War. Roosevelt said this, the true way in which we, the men and women of today, can show that we do in our souls, and not merely with our lips, pay homage to the men of the mighty past, is to face our work, our duties today, in the spirit in which they faced their duties. He concluded by calling on all Americans to, this is a quote, dedicate ourselves to the service of the ideals for which, for which this man, meaning Lincoln, stood, and that we prove our faith in him and his teachings, not merely by praising him for what he did in facing the issues of a buried past, but by working in his spirit, his spirit of love of liberty, of love of justice, of insistence upon order as the handmaid of liberty and justice. Houseling ended the speeches with a note of thanks to the executors of Van Horn's estate, members of the Lincoln Post, and also to Borglum, saying of the statue, saying of, saying of the, the statue to the sculptor, here is Lincoln as he was in life. And in a bit of revisionist history, since Newark had not voted for Lincoln in either the election of 1860 or 1864, Housling added, in no city of the country could a statue of Lincoln be more appropriately placed than in Newark. The unveiling of the statue was the culmination of a massive Memorial Day parade that had been held in Newark for many years, <clears throat> and for many years had featured the city's Civil War veterans. The Newark Evening News, which put out an addition, the afternoon of the unveiling, estimated that the per parade's procession numbered 5,000 marchers. No figure of the Civil War veterans was given, but the paper did note that their advancing age and ever-increasing infirmities had taken their toll. Their, de their depleted ranks told the story of time, as did the faltering steps of some of the marchers, the Newark News reported. It was the smallest number of Civil War veterans yet in any annual parade here. Some who insisted upon marching were so weak that they had to be assisted by their more stalwart comrades or by their sons. Despite this, the Civil War veterans maintained their position of prominence in the parade and did so in Newark until they were no longer able to march. Let me say one last thing about the size of the crowd at the dedication before I turn my ten attention to the statue's legacy. At the time, Newark was a thriving, growing, industrialized city that was still industrializing and on its way in a few years to reaching what many scholars consider its peak period. In terms of population, Newark was larger then than it is today and many of the city's residents in 1911 were newly arrived immigrants. According to the newspaper accounts, the presence of the immigrant population added greatly to the crowd's numbers at the unveiling of the Lincoln statue in 1911. The feeling being that somehow these people believed they could strengthen their ties to their new adopted homeland by participating in a ceremony honoring someone as prominent as Lincoln and in seeing up close a former president president, and the only living one at that. Both before and after the dedication, the newspapers reported, many parents with children in, children in their arms or at their side approached, approached Roosevelt just to have him touch them, almost as a rite of naturalization. And the paper said he accommodated them all. So what has the statue meant? For many years, the seated Lincoln was the focal point in Newark of an annual commemoration of Lincoln on his birthday, February 12th, a tradition that unfortunately has come and gone. There is a famous picture of baseball great Jackie Robinson stopping by the statue with some children while he was still playing. One of them is Roy Campanella's son, up at the top. What's not so well known was that the visit came on Newark's observance of Lincoln's birthday. The statue has also served as a backdrop or prop for, for an untold number of aspiring actors and actresses seeking publicity 
and politicians looking to make a connection with the Lincoln mystique or to Newark. This is a photograph of former Newark Congressman Peter Odino taken at the Lincoln statue in 1989. This is another one that was taken on St. Patrick's Day of 1990. This is Tom Giblin, uh, president of the Freeholder Board at the time, to the left. Seated was Phil Keegan, who was the chairman of the State Democratic Party, and behind him was um, Tom Barrett, who was the spokesman for the Freeholder Board in Essex County. This statue has been featured on the cover of magazines. This was the cover of, uh, of Collier's magazine, it's no longer in print, that, um, that they used. It has been used in ads. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is the Newark, uh, this, statue, this picture was kind of uh, manipulated a, a little bit to put the buildings in the background, but this is the Lincoln statue uh, that the Newark Sunday Call used on the cover of its magazine uh, section. It's been used in ads. This is a picture of the Lincoln statue was, that was used in an ad for uh, DuPont pigments. There was some text alongside of it that I didn't include, but this was the, uh, the photo that was used in the magazine ad. And it's been dusted off when a newspaper editorial needed a visual symbol of equal justice under the law. This is a um, picture of the statue that um, the Star-Ledger ran uh, when the United States Supreme Court released its famous decision in the Brown versus Board of Edu Education case in 1954. But probably most of all, the statue has been a place where parents for every generation of Newarkers since the piece was installed a century ago have brought their children to play, to be photographed, or to get a quick history lesson. My father, who's here tonight, remembers his mother bringing him to the Lincoln statue to share in the glory and promise of America. He is but one of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of children to have had that experience. And you know what? Many of them remember that moment for the rest of their lives. The statue has also had three poems written up to it and about it that I can find. And the one I find most touching, written more than 60 years ago by a member of the Vermont Supreme Court, who later became a federal court judge in Washington, in Washington DC, rejoices in the beauty and significance of watching children at play on and around the statue. I was successful in getting the poem by William Philip Stafford printed on the inside of the program that will be distributed at tomorrow's commemoration of the statue starting at 1.30 p.m. I hope some of you will be able to make it. And by the way, the sculptor, Gutzon Borglum, was very much in favor of children, or anyone for that matter, coming into contact with his work. Right from the dedication ceremony, when he stepped in firmly to stop a policeman from shooing away a curious boy with an outstretched hand from the piece. From the Lincoln statue, Borglum went on to do his signature piece, the giant heads of Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Teddy Roosevelt at Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota. He started the project in 1927 and didn't quite live to see it finished in 1941. His son oversaw its completion. One of the last major pieces that Borglum dedicated before he began the Mount Rushmore project was the Wars of America statue in Newark's Military Park, another piece that was paid for by the Van Horn estate, only its cost was $100,000. The third statue that Van Horn paid for was the statue of George Washington in Washington Park. Despite the success he enjoyed in his career, Borglum never forgot the Lincoln statue in Newark and it held a special place in his heart. A couple days ago, his granddaughter, who has written a book about his work, emailed me part of a letter that Borglum wrote to a friend of his in 1915. This is what it said. I was determined to try the experiment of creating a piece of museum sculpture for the public square instead of the conventional monument and see what happened. I am pleased to say it has been a complete success. I don't think I have got a statue in the country as a piece of art that my conscience reverts to and my heart reaches out to surround as naturally and as often as a Lincoln statue. 
From the accounts of both Ralph Lum and Borglum, Roosevelt left the dedication ceremony that day in Newark so enthused by his reception that it played a large part in convincing him to run for the presidency again in 1912. For those who remember their history, Roosevelt challenged William Howard Taft, the man he had anointed to succeed him as president in 1908 for the Republican nomination for president in 1912. After failing to get the Republican nomination, Roosevelt ran for president as the progressive or bull moose party candidate and got more votes than Taft, the sitting president, but losing to the Democratic candidate, Woodrow Wilson. It was the best showing by a third party candidate in the history of the United States presidency. Roosevelt's plans to seek the nation's highest office again once more in 1920 were dashed by his death in 1990, 1919 at age 60. But he too throughout his life continued to have thoughts of the Lincoln statue and his visit to Newark that day in 1911. In writing a friend, he said the following, and this also is from Borglum's granddaughter. Let me say, the more I see of that statue of Lincoln, the greater I regard it as a work of real art, the lofty soul of a great man expressed as only a genuine artist could express it. I am very glad to have had a chance of being connected with this dedication. Another interesting sidelight to the unveiling ceremony is that of Chancellor Maylon Pitney, who turned over the statue to the GAR post from the Van Horn estate. He was nominated by President Taft in early 1912 to serve as an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. He was confirmed and served on the High Court for a number of years. No doubt this was done with the presence of Woodrow Wilson in mind, but perhaps the overwhelming reception that Teddy Roosevelt got in Newark on Memorial Day 1911 played a part in Taft's decision as well. Could it have been that Taft was thinking he could kill two birds with one stone in selecting Pitney for the High Court? countering Wilson, but also countering Roosevelt in a state that was up for grabs in the election of 1912. And by the way, law firms bearing the names of both Malon Pitney and Ralph Lum continue in existence in New Jersey today. Day Pitney in Florham Park, which incidentally was Justice Brennan's law firm as well at one point, and also Lum, Drasco, and Positan in Roseland. So the seated Lincoln statue is celebrating its 100th anniversary. For the record, it is not the only seated statue of Abraham Lincoln in this country. Some places even have copies of ours, Boise, Idaho being one of them. In the mid-1970s, the people at Mount Rushmore even wanted to pay to have Newark statue wrapped up and flown to South Dakota to be duplicated offering to have the statue refurbished in return. Thankfully, the offer was turned down because who knows if it ever would have come back. Beside the giant statue of Lincoln in the, in the memorial that bears his name in Washington, D.C., the one in Newark is probably the best known. This simple image of Lincoln sitting on a bench, his right hand resting on the bench to provide support, the left folded across his lap, and his patented stovepipe hat resting beside him has, has survived the test of time and seems likely to survive as a national icon for as long as Lincoln is revered. Bronze replicas and engraved photographs of the statue were sold in Newark department stores right from the time of the dedication. Over the years, the image of the seated Lincoln has also appeared on postcards, bookends, medals, pins, buttons, plates, and medallions. We can only hope that future generations will appreciate it and look after it so that it will not just last another hundred years, but for hundreds and hundreds of years to come. Thank you, and I appreciate your attention. If, if anyone has any questions, I'll do the best I can to try. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, as usual, there is through uh, dedication to uh, the history of Newark is well received. Um, Thank you. Probably would have not been done by anyone else, including this and the, the fire um, uh, 
commemoration of the Graham statue, all of which um, I think the city uh, as a whole uh, should uh, congratulate you on all of those achievements. Uh, I'm interested in, um, I suppose maybe it's a book, uh, The Transformation of the Attitudes of Newark from the pre-Civil War era, where the sympathies in Newark were, um, I guess, mercantile as far as their, the business they did with the South. Obviously, as you mentioned, uh, Lincoln was not favored here in the elections. Up to the 1911 uh, were obviously things that turned around completely, uh, given the evidence of the huge crowd that attended this. Do you have any brief thoughts on, on that? Uh, well, you know, actually, that subject was um, taken up um, quite expertly at the um, Newark History Society last, last program. Um, which focused on the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's visit to Newark in February of 1861. And um, it's very true that Lincoln was not a popular figure here. In fact, it was mentioned in that presentation that when Lincoln came to Newark um, in February of 1861, just back up a little bit, and I'll repeat a little bit of what was said the other night. It's not my research, but it was someone else's, and I hope my memory serves me right. Gail, maybe you can help me out here if I'm not uh, fully correct. But Lincoln, after Lincoln's election in um, 1860, uh, he went back to Springfield, Illinois. And the, the inauguration uh, in those days wasn't as quick as it is today. He wasn't inaugurated until March of 1861. And there was still some question, even though, you know, he thought he had had the, the votes, enough electoral votes to win, it was a question of, you know, is, was he really going to get them when the electors actually came to cast their votes? So Lincoln kept a very low profile in Springfield and um, until he actually heard that, you know, he had been elected president. Something didn't happen, you know, for weeks after the election. So he goes to Springfield and in deciding, in, in going to Washington for the inauguration, instead of going right from Illinois to Washington, Lincoln took kind of a very circuitous route and came through Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, up through upstate New York, down to New York City, and that's when he crossed the Hudson to come to, to Newark. He took a train from Newark, stopped in Elizabeth, Rawway, uh, uh, New Brunswick, and then went to Trenton, where he gave a speech to the New Jersey State Senate, which I thought uh, the, state, the State Senate commemorated this year, and I thought w was a very fitting event. But his, his, he told people, Lincoln was not, he, Lincoln had relatives, distant relatives who would come to New Jersey and had lived in New Jersey. They, they, they had lived in Monmouth County, so he did have some connection here, but he was not really fond of New Jersey. He didn't want to, he never spent much time here, didn't have a whole lot good to say about it, and he wanted to make his trip here very quick. And he told the people along the way that he didn't want to speak, he didn't want to say much, he just wanted to kind of come through. And I think one of the things that um, was most telling about his trip to Newark, he came um, through what they called the, um, by train, to what they called the Upper Depot at the time, took a, um, a carriage ride, a procession that went down Broad Street, he got on another train at Chestnut Street that took him, you know, down through the other cities to, to Trenton. And I think what I got out of the presentation of the night was most telling that somewhere along the procession line, there was a, um, someone had hung an effigy of Lincoln. And with a, a sign that had a um, very offensive racist remark attached to it. So Lincoln was, was not a revered figure here, but then when he was assassinated in 1865, his body, body was brought through Newark on the way to, uh, you know, to, be, um, to lie in state in New York, and apparently there was a, you know, a fairly big outpouring. So I don't know if, if, um, if attitudes had changed over that time or because of his death, but um, Newark did have very strong ties to the South, um, commercial ties. 
and um, leather, cotton, and you know, people here, the business community, felt that Lincoln's election could threaten that business, and um, you know, but it just wasn't in Newark. Lincoln didn't win uh, the vote in New Jersey either in either election. In the first, if I have my history correct, in the first election he got no electoral votes, and in the, in eight, the election of 1864 he got a few. So um, yes, you're right. There were strong uh, Newark had strong business ties to the South, and as a result. Um, Lincoln was not a particularly popular figure here, and um, you know some of that uh, attitude was expressed on his trip here. But then again, there were, you know, uh, Mr. Van Horn was, uh, I think, a prime representative of the other side of the coin, which is that, you know, people did think that they were fighting for the preservation of the Union, and they were ready to go out and die for it. Someone else, Gail. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if Lincoln's son Robert was. I believe he was alive, but he was not here. And I don't see any mention in the um, in the research um, that he was invited. Uh, he he was a um, a good friend of Borglum's, though. But I don't know if he had, you know, maybe Memorial Day was a, a day for him to be somewhere else rather than here. I, I don't really know, but he, there's nothing in the, in the uh, research uh, material that, that talks about uh, um, Lincoln's son, Robert. And was Housing himself a Republican? Housing was a Republican. Housing's, Housing's kind of a <laughs> weird figure. Um, he had been sheriff of Essex County before he became mayor of Newark. He was basically um, a front man for the business community in Newark. Lived on High Street. Um, very much liked being mayor. Very much liked walking down the street, having people acknowledge him as mayor. So much so that after he left the job, after, after he was no longer mayor of Newark, and he was out of the limelight, he actually committed suicide by stabbing himself to death because he just, according to his wife, I've read the, the, the articles in the paper, he just couldn't stand not being in the limelight anymore. Which seems like a pretty vicious way to, en to end things if you're, you know. But, um, you know, he, he, you know, I mean, he very much was a, was a, uh, was a, was a man who was the, uh, you know, a vehicle of the business community at the time. It, to some degree, I think you could say that uh, Godfrey Kruger kind of was instrumental in running Nork at the time, but there were any number of other businessmen. They had a business commission at the time that kind of orchestrated how the city business would be, would be run, and, and Housling was their guy. Yes, sir. Did I hear you correctly, uh, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Mello, and Mr. Borman getting the uh Mr. Lum, Ralph Lum. Oh, Ralph Lum. Yes. Uh, oh, Mr. Daniels design. I'm sorry? He was instrumental in getting the... Uh, Ralph Lum, the, the, the executor of the Van Horn estate, Ralph Lum was a friend of Borglum's. And Borglum came and said, listen, I want this job, but I don't want to compete for it. it you know, it's still kind of a practice today that you have competitions for you know, uh, uh, for, you know, public art, whatever. And um, that's what the, the three-man local committee wanted. And Borglum wanted the job but didn't want to compete. He thought he was at a higher stature in that. He thought that competition was for uh, sculptors who were still kind of rising in the, in the profession. And um, Lum essentially ran interference for him. And um, also for the Wars of America, um, statue in Military Park as well. The interesting thing about Borglum, <laughs> Borglum was a guy, and I'm not going to get into this too deeply, but Borglum was a guy who couldn't get enough work. He wanted to be busy all the time sculpting something when he finally decided to move from painting to sculpting. And, you know, even when he was doing Mount Rushmore, he was leaving South Dakota, 
Dakota and going other places to do all sorts of other jobs. He had assistants who would do, you know, a lot of the sculpting work for him. He would sit down with the people and say, okay, what do you want? And then, you know, he would work on it or he would leave it to someone else to do. Borglum was very interested in the, um, the Washington statue in Washington Park. And, um, but Borglum was a little difficult to deal with. He was a perfectionist and um, he didn't like to be rushed. And um, I don't know, I can't tell you whether, you know, the people who chose the sculptor for the Washington statue said, you know, he just can't cram this into a schedule as well, or whether Borglum realized that himself, but uh, he didn't get that job. And um, uh, it was probably, probably a good thing because maybe the Lincoln, he would have rushed the Lincoln statue and it, it wouldn't have been what it became. I'll also say this, this is in the, um, in the research material from the, um, the Lum law firm and the, of the, 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 the Pitney law firm, um, they obviously know the Supreme Court connection. I don't know that they're all that familiar with Malon Pitney's connection to this particular event, but the Lum firm is very, um, cognizant of Lum's connection to the Lincoln statue. I had, have had contact with them. They have photographs of it. Uh, you know, Ralph Lum was a very, very prominent attorney in Newark and uh, became uh, president of the State Bar Association, I'm thinking sometime in the late 30s or 1940s, argued any number of cases before the United States Supreme Court. Ralph Lum was a guy who, if he took a case, you pretty much knew he was going to win because of who he was. Um, and as I say, that firm is, um, you know, knows very much the, of Lum's connection to this event and uh, is proud of it and kind of puts it out there. Yes, Joe. Uh, Guy, I just wanted to part this information. If you go down railroad, down New Jersey Railroad Avenue near Penn Station, there is a street called Lum Lane. Okay. So, uh, that street named after him in yeah. Well, the family, I believe, was from Chatham, and I'm not sure if the, you know, if um, if they, the Lum family lived here or not. But um, he certainly practiced here and was very, very highly regarded for many, many years. They, even today, to have a, you know, major law firm um, named in your honor, it's, it's uh, you know, Lum firm's very respected firm in New Jersey. I think Rob can tell us that, right? Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to add a little uh, to your comments about the wonderful uh, lecture we heard recently uh, about Newark and Lincoln because I went and looked up Lincoln's remarks in Trenton and uh, he addressed both houses and, and the interesting thing to me uh, because Lincoln had maintained this silence uh, for close to three months um, for the reasons uh, mentioned. And uh, I began to hatch this theory at the uh, lecture um, a week ago. But I, I uh, in fact, there was a tremendously enthusiastic response uh, to Lincoln as he made that ride from the, what's it, it used to be the- Upper Depot. Right, down to Chestnut Street. And uh, 25,000 people, I think it was, and just great admiration and, and enthusiasm. And, and we had a little bit of discussion about, well, how real was that, or, uh, and so on. But, but my own thoughts, just when he spoke to the uh, New Jersey Senate, remember we were told that he made reference to a book about George Washington he had read. But when he got to the legislature, he, this was the point at which he stamped his foot, possibly wearing a shoe made in, in uh, Newark, and, and firmly uh, said, I know that many of you disagree with me, but I know that I can count on you if, if your support is needed uh, to do the right thing, and uh, so on, I mean, he said it quite eloquently. These were brief remarks, but I think it might have been the first point on this trip where he really asserted that that uh, commitment, you know, that characterized, of course, his, his whole 
Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I know this. Lincoln, when Lincoln went to Trenton, he wasn't, um, I, I don't know that he spoke before a, a, a you know, joint session of the legislature because, yeah, okay. Uh, he wasn't particularly keen about speaking before the assembly because in the days leading up to um, his stop in Trenton, one of the assemblymen um, had uh, offered a resolution that essentially, uh, and asked for passage of it, basically describing, uh, asking for ratification of a, of a uh, description of Lincoln as the ugliest man in the world. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, he, he certainly had his detractors here, and um, uh, and he knew about that. He knew about that resolution, and, and and wasn't, you know, obviously too happy about it. Someone else? Yes, ma'am. Similar to this vantage point, um, apparently Wells Fargo has done a series of murals in their branches to tie into their local communities. And it's a historic photo, so it's from this vantage point, and you see the you know, dirt streets and the buildings of that area. Okay, well, I think that's great. You know, I mean, uh, I. I, I, you know, the, the library has, uh, you know, these pictures, not some, the newer pictures are pictures that I had taken, but the archival photos are all in the library. And, uh, you know, I think it, it's great that uh, anyone in the city, any business, any school, whomever, um, I don't know if the Lincoln School in Newark has, you know, anything um, connected to Lincoln at all, but I think it's great when this statue is, uh, is given some recognition. Any other questions? One more. One, two more. Wilson not involved, do you know, in the dedication? I don't know. Um, I, you know, Borglum obviously was, was um, key in getting Roosevelt here. And, um, you know, Roosevelt, when he left the presidency, he went to Africa on a long safari, came back to New York, was working in New York as a, as a um, I believe, a magazine editor. And um, I guess the word had leaked out that, you know, well, I mean, it was well known at the time that, that Roosevelt wasn't keen about Taft's presidency. Taft was a little bit too conservative for, for Roosevelt. Uh, far too conservative for Roosevelt and Roosevelt but you know I mean to have two people two major participants of this event walk away and each one of them saying independently that this dedication was what convinced Teddy Roosevelt to run for the presidency again in 1912 I think is pretty significant you don't find that in the history books but 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 Roosevelt was quoted as saying to um, Borglum they love me you know, he's looking at 25,000 people out there. He's not thinking about Lincoln. He's thinking about, you know, he's thinking about himself. Uh, I don't, it's a good question. I, I don't really know why. Um, maybe they just felt that, uh, you know, they wanted to keep it all Republican. I don't know. Yes, sir. I just had a question about the scale of the statue. I think you had mentioned the first is the Washington statue in Washington Park. I was wondering if you could verify that. Say that again? The scale of the statue, the scale of the Lincoln statue, or the just watch them like, correct? Yeah. This is one and a half. I don't, I'm, I don't know what the one in um, Washington Park is. You know, the, the one in Washington Park, actually Taft was supposed to come to the dedication of the Washington statue in Newark and, and, and pulled out at the last minute, um, which would have been nice. But, um, uh, you know, I've never been up there to, to you know, size it up compared to myself, but beautiful statue. Yeah, to me it looks like it's life, regular, lifelike. Could be, yeah. Versus right, yeah. Uh, John Massey Ryan was a sculptor. Um, very well regarded sculptor. I don't really know a lot about him, but um, very well regarded. And um, if I'm not mistaken, it was either 1912 or 1913, one of those two years that that statue was dedicated. And, you know, um, maybe we can, uh, the Newark History Society, you know, we've been talking about having a program of Newark's 
outdoor sculptures and you know maybe that'll be it should be part of it that would be a nice tie-in to do it with that and I'm hoping that by then that year that the city will uh, step forward and also recognize Mr. Van Horn who you know obviously was uh, was a great patriot and a great lover of the city of Newark you know I'm I, in, in preparation for all this back in oh I'd say um, January February I did some exhaustive research to try to find if Van, there were any Van Horns, if the family had any descendants anywhere in New Jersey. And I even wrote letters to a couple of the genealogical societies out in Warren County. And um, the little town where he grew up is, is not in existence anymore. It's just like, you know, I know there's probably somebody out there who's, you know, uh, distant nephew or who knows what, but. Um, I, I, you know, I tried to find them just to see if they are aware of the connection, and I haven't had any luck yet, but I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to continue, but I'm not really thinking that that's going to lead me anywhere, anywhere great, but um, uh, it'd be nice if he were remembered somewhere. And by the way, 73 Market Street is, I'm not, and I can't tell you it's the same building, but there is still a 73 Market Street. It's, a, it's an art gallery right in among that, uh, that row of furniture stores. So. He was in there, and also he built some buildings behind it. He was, you know, he was there at the right time with the kind of business that, that uh, Newarkers wanted, that um, as the city was growing and thriving and people were looking to, you know, people were building homes and furnishing homes, and, uh, uh, you know, he was at the forefront of that business and uh, you know, became very prosperous and wanted to give something back, and uh, I think he certainly did.